gather together if we can. Pastor Gordon, you're going to work tonight, or are you just going to sit and... Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, well, I just want to say an in introduction, how glad I am to be here. I kind of felt compelled to come here tonight. I just felt a, an unction, and I, I hope I wasn't too obnoxious, knocking on the door and saying, I really want to speak to my friends at Faith Christian, uh, because I really did. Um, t I'm dressed up. Tonight is Purim. Tonight is the celebration of the Feast of Esther, and we're going to tie that in uh, to the message. Um, I do want to thank Aaron and Sam uh, for all the food and the setup. It's so nice. And Tony, who's, I throw him some curves. When I came in, I just said, I got all these things to do, and, I, and he's handling the curves and the audiovisual stuff. So that's just wonderful for me. makes my life easier. Um, and they do the hard work. I just... Uh, get to speak, which is nice. Um, topic is Israel, the church in the last days. We're going to do the preamble to that tonight. We're going to do the two-step introduction because it is Purim, and the Feast of Purim ties in very closely with what's going on now in the Middle East. And so I want to tie this together, and um, if you'll follow along, I think you'll pick up some pointers that you might not necessarily have picked up just from the news and the coverage of what's going on in Israel, Gaza, um, the northern part of Israel. So, Father B'Shem Yeshu, in the name of Jesus, I pray for ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to us tonight, uh, that we would be uh, wise and have understanding and that you would give us your wisdom, your vision, your heart. Um, and I pray this in Jesus' name, B'Shem Yeshua, our Messiah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Mm. Overall, I want to say first up, because it's most important to know that when we fight battles, we fight in the spirit. Our Weapons of warfare are not flesh and blood. They're not carnal. They're, we're fighting powers and principalities. Powers and principalities. And I'm going to show you that from the Bible. Um, first off, um, we're going to put up Daniel uh, chapter 10. So Daniel chapter 10, uh, it says, But the prince of Persia, Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. And you know the story. Daniel's praying and he's fasting and he's getting nothing. You know, how many of you have been praying and fasting and nothing, zero? But after 21 days, an angel from God comes and says to Daniel, Daniel, I heard your prayers from the, God heard your prayers from the beginning. He sent me, but I was resisted by the prince of Persia. Where is Persia? What country is Persia today? Iran. Now, Iran, the prince of Persia is a spirit. It's a power. It's a principality over that area. But it's a spirit that resists God's will for his people and his land. And then the second scripture is probably equally important. Um, Oh, one more. <laughs> I think, is it 1020? What's the next one up? Can you get me the next one up there? 1021? Yes, there it is. Thank you. Soon I will return. So the angel that's talking to Daniel says, soon I will return to fight against the prince of Persia. So that fight is continuing. But when I go, the prince of Greece will come. I just thought about that for a while. What is the prince of Greece? What is Greek thinking? What is this stronghold that we call the prince of Greece? Well, Greek thinking is what we call today secular humanism. That man is the measure of all things, not God. And so what happened, and it's the prince of the air, it's the prince of the media, it's the prince of information. So what's happening today? 
There's a fight against the prince of Persia in the spirit, and the prince of Grisha has entered that fight with the media, with the television, with the coverage, all that's going on. And I just want you to know you're not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting against powers and principalities. So overarching, because I'm going to say some hard things tonight, but keep in the back of your mind that I'm talking about powers and principalities. First thing I'm going to say um, is if you haven't read the book of Esther recently, that's where we get the holiday of Purim from, which is today. It's why I'm dressed in a costume, because we like to dress in costumes on Purim. Um, if you haven't read Esther, please read Esther. If you have kids, read Esther to the kids. A couple chapters a night is a bedtime story. It's the most wonderful story, easy to read, reads like a um, play, like a novel, and um, has great spiritual insight. And so during this reading of the book of Esther, which we do today, because it's Purim, we learn in um, chapter three that there's a wicked, evil man in the kingdom. Uh, the king is called Ahasuerus. You might have in your Bible Xerxes, uh, but his real name is Ahasuerus. And Ahasuerus um, has a great party, right? And uh, the guy basically drinks all the time and um, has a six-month party. And during this time, he has to get rid of his old queen. He decides to get rid of his old queen, has a beauty pageant for a new queen, and Esther is chosen. Esther is Jewish, but she's hiding her Jewish identity. And you're all familiar with that story. But it says that the king in chapter 3 then raises up a man called Haman. And so, you, I mean, not, you know, so that's nice. And if you're like me, um, when you read the um, genealogies, I tend to skip over them. Do you tend to skip over them? Come on, be truthful. You know, there's a lot of them. But it says in chapter 3 of Esther, after these things, King Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So I would normally say, oh, he picked Haman, and on I would go reading the story. But then I got to thinking, who is Hamadatha, and what is an agite? You know, it's, is it a pretty rock? No, I don't know, an agite. So I go back and I look, and in, lo and behold, in Exodus chapter 17, uh, verses 1 through 8, we have the story of the Israelites coming out of Egypt and basically fetching with Moses. We don't have any water, complaining, right? They're complaining with Moses. And then at the very end, uh, towards uh, verse 8 of Exodus uh, chapter 17, we, we read this horrible thing that goes on. Um, and I don't know if we can get it up on the screen, but I'll read it to you. Um, now, it says, after all this fetching and um, the, the problems that they had at Massa and Meribah, the next verse, in verse 8 of Exodus 17, is, Now Amalek came and fought with the Israelites at Rephidim. So Amalek, this group of people, came and fought with Israel, and that was the place where Joshua and Hur held up Moses' hand. And when the hand was held up, they were victorious, and when his hand put... Um, so you know that story. Why did they fight with them? Because the Agagites attack the people from behind. They didn't come and fight like this initially. They went after the women and the children and the stragglers and the weak. Chicken. Yes, chicken. chicken. Ch and and um, horrible. And how do we know that? Because in Deuteronomy 25, verses 17 through 19, 19 it says, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out. They met you on the journey and attacked all who were lagging behind because they had no fear of God. And what did Moses say to do? You shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. 
pretty serious talk. Again, we're talking about powers and principalities here, please. But we're talking about the powers and principalities being attached to human action. Now, the story continues with Amalek, and you're familiar with this story. Another story we're familiar with, but I'm just pulling it together for you tonight. King Saul is the king of Israel, and he's told to go out and fight. And what does Samuel tell him to do? Destroy all of the Amalekites. Why? Because God had commanded the Israelites back in Deuteronomy to destroy all of Amalek. What did Sam? What did uh, Saul do? You know, he, he Samuel comes to meet him. He goes, "Yeah, yeah, Samuel, praise God. You know, I've done what you've commanded." And Samuel goes, "What's that bleeding of sheep that I hear? You know, isn't obedience better than sacrifice?" You know, and isn't your disobedience almost like witchcraft? You know, what you've done is not obey me. And it, it's serious business. And who did Samuel's, did Saul spare? He spared a guy named Agag, who was the king of the Amalekites. Now, I don't know how Haman, who is our Arch enemy in the book of Esther became a son or a descendant of Agag, the Amalekite, but that's what the Bible says he was. And so disobedience by Saul somehow has led us to the place in the book of Esther where we're confronted with evil. Now, how do I know Haman is evil? You know, let me read to you from the book of Esther. Now, Haman gets promoted. He's number two in the land. I mentioned the king is a drunk. And so the king is, you know, uh, what is it, the 25th Amendment we have if somebody's not able to function? The, so Haman is basically functioning for the king. And he walks out of the palace, and he is just, you know, riding high on in the second in command of this kingdom that goes from Ethiopia to India. It's the biggest kingdom in the world. And Mordecai, who's one of the leaders of the Jewish people in exile in the land of Persia, won't bow down to him. He won't bow down to him. Some people say Haman had a demon um, tattoo. I don't know. All I know is that Mordecai would not bow down. He'd give him, Mordecai was a good citizen, but he would not bow down to Haman. And Haman was furious. The Bible says Haman was furious. Now, if you were the second in command, or basically the head of this gigantic land, and somebody wouldn't bow down to you, and it made you angry, what would you do? Well, you know, if you were... You know, you, we were just in Williamsburg, uh, Virginia. You might put them in the pillars, you know, with the stocks in your feet and keep them in the public square for a while. Maybe you would do that. Maybe if you were really nasty, you'd hang them by his thumbs. Or if you were really, really nasty, like uh, Shogun, uh, the, uh, the Japanese warlords, you'd make tea out of them. You'd put them in a tea bag and put them in boiling water. I mean, that's if you're really nasty. But what does Haman do? Haman says, listen, listen. Haman sought to destroy, Haman disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone. So he just said, I'm not just going to get back at Mordecai for not bowing down to me. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai, the Jewish people, and Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ahasuerus, the people of Mordecai. Do you hear what I'm saying? Haman decided that because this one guy wouldn't bow down to him, he is going to annihilate all of the Jewish people. That, to me, is supernaturally evil. It's beyond evil. It's supernaturally evil. It's powers and principalities evil. And we see that in the book of Esther. 
So why am I telling you this? I mean, we're talking about Israel, the church, and the last days. Um, we can't get the video up, but so I'm going to describe to you what we're... Anybody see the movie Independence Day with Will Smith? Okay. It's a cool movie. I mean, I think it's a cool movie. So Will Smith has just come back. He's shot down an alien, and he's dragging the alien behind him, you know, and gets him to the place, and they go into this secret um, laboratory in New Mexico, right, where they, they're, they're experimenting on the aliens or trying to figure it out. And the scene I want you to listen to is the President of the United States. The President of the United States is coming to see the alien. And the president seems like a nice guy. I mean, he, he, he's kind of like, you know, um, hey, we, kumbaya, we can all get along. Let's, and his first thing is, hey, we have a lot to learn from you. You might have some things to learn from us. Can we have peace? And we'll pick it up over there. So just listen to the president. Um, we'll be talking with the alien. Dr. Oaken. <laughs> so the alien has Dr. Oaken by the throat here. Yes. Okay. Open the door. Get him out of there. No, wait. That's the president talking. Negotiate a truce. Negotiating a truce. We can find a way to coexist. Can there be a peace between us? Did you hear that exchange? Let's negotiate a peace. No peace. What do you want us to do? You know, I'm here, I'm representing all of America. What do you want us to do? We want you to die. There are enemies that you cannot negotiate with. There are spirits and powers you cannot negotiate with. Um, some of you are just under the World War II generation, there was no negotiation with Nazi Germany. You couldn't negotiate. They had one thing in mind, world conquest, destruction of all of the Jewish people and other people. But there was no negotiations possible. Some people make it very hard to negotiate with. Now, when I gave um, these scriptures, uh, they looked, he said, are you sure you want these scriptures? I mean, I've never put these scriptures up on the, sand, you know, up on the um, board before, right? And so 1 Titus chapter 1, verse 12. One of Crete's own prophets had said, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gut gluttons. That's a horrible thing to say about a people. I mean, what happens if you were from Crete, but you were a nice Cretan, right? 
But Paul writes that, and I said, how could that be? Let me research. Why are Cretans considered that way? And it was because their theology was that Zeus was a man who, through his actions, became a god, and some of his actions were beyond womanizing, beyond sexual immorality. They were just way out there. And they embraced, not only did they embrace that, but they exalted that. And there was no talking to them about it. And that characteristic that Paul writes about is part of who they are, a non-negotiable, a non-negotiable in their way. Now, I do want to say in 2 Peter 2, 4, what happens when you have non-negotiables in your life that are evil. God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. I mean, these are hard scriptures, and that's, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to, to say them because I love to talk about Passover, and I love to talk about eating, and I love to talk. But God says that there are devils that are chained to hell. And what happens if you have sin that chains you to this devil? Your sin can change you, chain you to the devil. Your mindset, your stubbornness, your non-negotiable can chain you to a devil. And when that devil is thrown into hell, it's kind of like you're tied to the devil that's going over the cliff. You are going over the cliff with them. And so I'm talking about what's happening in the Middle East. And, and again, powers and principalities, Prince of Persia, Prince of Grecia and the media. What I'm speaking about to you tonight is the fight that we have. Now, you may say to me, well, Ted, you know, it's your fight. You're Jewish. Uh, you got to deal with it. You know, do the best you can, right? I mean, what, what, what is this to me? What is this to me? And I'll tell you what it is to you. Because jihad, which has always meant, from the beginning, unrelenting warfare against, quote, non-believers in Islam, jihad is pinpointed right now at Israel, the Jewish people. But if you dig just a little under the surface, they'll tell you, that, yeah, first we're going to get those Saturday worshipers, and then we're going to get the Sunday worshipers. They're not just after Israel. You're up next. And so together, we have to be wise in dealing with the powers and principalities. Now listen, I understand that I was chained to sin. I was dead in my sin, but Jesus' blood can set us free from all unrighteousness, all iniquity, but nothing else. I can't intellectually get out of it. I couldn't uh, think my way out of it. I couldn't do good deeds my way out of it. I had to accept what Jesus did for me. And when I did, I was transformed from that kingdom of darkness, that chain into the pit. I was let go, and I was free, because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So our prayer is not for the destruction of the Arab people. I think I've told you before, I have an Arab, well, four Arab godchildren, Palestinian godchildren. They're wonderful. What makes them wonderful is they're believers in Jesus. <laughs> you know, the Arab people are wonderful people. I mean, just their cultures. If you've ever been with Arab people, they hug and they kiss and they, and they, they eat good food and they, they just really laugh a lot. But at the moment, many Arabs in Gaza are chained to a demonic mindset, a demonic religion, if you were. And that demonic religion is pulling them irrationally 
into the pit of hell with the demons who are being cast there. And so we need to pray, not for, we want to pray for victory, but most important is victory in Jesus, that his word would go forth. And what we're seeing in Israel and what we know in Gaza, you know, there are many Christians in Gaza, you know, breaks our heart. We had great relationships uh, with uh, Christians in Gaza before Gaza was sealed off. We were having prayer meetings. We're getting together. We're uh, taking communion together. Now, there are plenty of issues to talk about, but what's most important was our commonality um, that we were all accepted in the beloved. And that's um, our prayer for our Arab friends and neighbors, as it is for all of our loved ones. It really is our heart that no one would perish. No one would perish but all would come to faith in Jesus. Um, and, and we're seeing that in Israel. Now, the rest of the story in Esther is kind of interesting. So Haman convinces the king um, back in chapter 3. He, he starts a whisper campaign. You know what a whisper campaign is? Anybody in politics? A whisper campaign is when... You, you know, you, you have your platform that you talk about, and then you have people who spread gossip in the background. You know, I'll talk to you off the record, and they get somebody, and they get their ear. Do you have whisper campaigns in the church? Of course not, because it's evil. <laughs> but they had a whisper campaign, and this was Haman's whisper campaign. In verse 8 of chapter 3, Haman said to King Ahasuerus, as a certain people scattered and dispersed among all the people of your provinces, their laws are different. Okay, there's a grain of truth there, right? There's, their laws are different from all the people. Then they do not keep the king's laws. That wasn't true. But the laws are different? That's true. And you, your laws are different. You, you, you go by a higher standard than the people around you that's required by everyday law. Your laws are a little different as a believer in Jesus. But you also keep the laws of the United States. Same with the Jewish people in Persia. Then Haman said, therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. Do you hear the whisper and do you hear the lies and then you hear what his solution is? And if it pleases the king, verse 9, let a decree be written that they be destroyed and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver. Whatever, I'm going to give you a lot of money to do that. Put it in your treasury. So the king took his signet ring and gave it to Haman. And the decree was established. Haman cast lots. Lots in Hebrew, or I think it's Persian, is pur. He casted pur, like through dice. And purim is the plural of pur. You have one pur, one dice. If you have two, you have a pur. If you have two dice, you have purim. Okay? Why do I tell you that? If you have, if you have one book, you have a seder. If you have two books, you have a sederim. Plural. Breshit bara Elohim et hashemayim ve'et ha'aretz. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. It's a plural ending on that. I mean, I, I pray for my Jewish friends and neighbors. Like, look, it's a plural ending. And then God says, and God's spirit rests over the water. And we know Jesus is the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We, we see the Godhead in its fullness right from the beginning. That was an aside. Purim. <laughs> Purim. The Feast of Esther, casting lots, and a date was chosen. And the date was actually 12 and a half months in the future. And I was speaking with somebody that the Jewish calendar is a lunar calendar, and you have to add a leap month seven times every 19 years. It's like really bizarre, but in order to make things sync. 
Um, and just by the way, the Easter this year is so out of whack with Passover, it makes me furious. But that was by design of the Nicene Council. Um, because they decided they didn't want the Holy Day of Easter to be, to be tied up with a Jewish holiday. And they say that, they wrote it. And so they divorced Easter from Passover, and now you're going to celebrate Easter on the first Sunday after the full moon, after the spring equinox. Instead of on the Sunday of Passover week, which in Passover week, if you look at Leviticus 23, you have Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Feast of First Fruits. All those three feasts are called Passover. And the Feast of First Fruits is on the morrow after the Sabbath. The day after Saturday is the Feast of First Fruits. Jesus is the first fruit of many brethren to rise from the dead. He fulfilled that holiday. He fulfilled Passover by being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He fulfilled the unleavened bread by being sinless. But he also fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits by Resurrection Day. So it makes me angry that it's divorced from its Jewish roots this year. So bizarrely crazy that you won't, you'll have Easter next week, which is great. I mean, we have to celebrate his resurrection and his victory, but I like it when it's tied in with first fruits. Haman gets this decree. It's 13 months in the future, and he is just getting ready, getting prepared. But God, who's not mentioned in the book of Esther, is working behind the scenes. God is totally involved. And sometimes doesn't it feel like not only like Daniel that we pray and nothing happens, but sometimes we say, where are you, God? Where are you, God? But know that God promises never to leave you, never to forsake you, to be with you. Even if you don't see him or hear from him, he is on your side. Amen. And he also loves to see you. His face lights up when he sees you. When you go to your father, his face lights up. He wants to see you. He gets joy. You get joy from seeing him. And so God's working behind the scenes. And what happens is Haman is exposed for the wicked plot to kill all of the Jewish people. Queen Esther reveals her Jewishness to the king. She had it hidden. And the king turns the tables on Haman. Haman gets the fate that he wanted for Mordecai. And then all the people who were going to fight against the Jewish people realize that, wait a second, this is not so good. The king's favor is turning. Some were stubborn. Some said, we're going to fight him anyway. We got this permission by this edict. We're going to fight him. And they were um, taken out. They really were. Um, the Jewish people got victory over their enemies. And why is that important? Because when the people saw, the everyday people, saw what was happening, the Bible says that many of those people, many of those people in the kingdom, remember, it's the biggest kingdom on the face of the earth, many of the people, many of the people became um, Yeah, verse 17 of, of chapter 8. Then many of the people of the land became Jewish because of the, Jew, the fear of the Jews fell on them. We're not looking for anyone to become Jewish. We are looking for people to follow Jesus no matter what their background is. But the principle is the same. As we have victory, people can see tables turning. People can see God's hand, even if God is not mentioned. People can read what your life is doing in the community, and many people will become followers of Jesus because of what God is doing. Amen. And that's what, that's what our heart is. Our heart is to see many people uh, come to the Lord. Okay, so one day we'll talk about Israel, the church, and the last days, but 
are we not talking about that now? Just an introduction. What we're seeing in Israel, uh, what we're seeing in the world, we thought was impossible six months ago, that all the nations of the earth would come against Israel. We were two votes in the United Nations away from that. And um, those two votes, by the way, were Russia and China. How's that for interesting? We're in the times that the prophets saw. And we want to be wise in these times. Now listen, not everything Israel does is godly. Then It's not a country that by and large um, no, believes in God. There's a lot of atheists there. There's a lot of religious people there who, who don't know God. But God has a covenant with Israel the Jewish people, and that's where we're all in tonight. God's covenant with the Jewish people. Genesis chapter 17. Um, In Genesis chapter 17, and you're familiar with this story too. Um, It's it's a great um, chapter of 17, verse 12. It says, whoever is eight days old among you should be circumcised in the generation, and that will be the sign of the covenant in your flesh. And God says to Abraham, as for your wife, Sarai, listen, I've heard you. Call her Sarah. She'll be uh, the mother of many, many people, and nations will come for her. And what does Abraham do? Abraham, our man of faith, in Genesis 17, 17. And Abraham fell on his face and laughed. (laughs) That's Abraham's faith reaction to God saying, Sarah's going to have a kid. Couldn't grab it. So what does Abraham do? Abraham says to God, O God, verse 18, that Ishmael might live before you. Ishmael was Abraham's son, his firstborn son to Hagar, but his firstborn son, and Abraham loved Ishmael. Just have to keep that in mind. Abraham loved Ishmael, and he said, God, that Ishmael might live before you. And God said, in verse 19, now depending on your translation, some of your, the next word after that in verse 19 will be yes. Some of the verses will say no. Uh, but the Hebrew word is aval, which means but. So God said, but Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, or Yitzchak, which means laughter. Just as a little remembrance there, Abraham. Um, and I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant with his descendants. God's covenant promise is to the Jewish people. And just as a reminder, the covenant is three parts. In Genesis chapter 12, God is going to bless those who bless Abraham and his descendants. God is going to make him a mighty nation. He's going to give him the land of Israel. And most importantly, through Abraham's seed, all of the nations will be blessed. Who is Abraham's seed? It's Jesus, the Messiah. And then God says, my covenant I will establish with Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob. But as for Ishmael, Verse 20, I've heard you, and behold, I have blessed him. I will make him fruitful. I'll multiply him. He'll beget 12 princes. I'll make him a great nation. But my covenant I'll establish with Isaac. Please hear me on this. The Koran says that because Ishmael was the firstborn, he deserves the covenant. And in a natural way of thinking, it's not fair. He's not getting the covenant. He's the firstborn. But in God's way of looking at the world, the covenant of the land of Israel, of blessing the Jewish people, and the descendancy of Jesus is going to go through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in God's kingdom, he's going to bless Ishmael. You know, when I go out to you with my wife, Diane, um, I'll order one thing and she'll order something else. And um, I'll look at what she ordered and I'll say, can I have a piece of that? 
you know, cut, cut me off a little piece because it looks better than what I ordered. And she always gives me a look like, you know, if you wanted it, you could have ordered it. And she, but she's kind and she gives me a piece. Um, I give her a piece. Sometimes we think of God promises like a pie. And if I get a big piece, you're getting a littler piece because it's only one pie. But that's not the kingdom of God. With God, there's covenant promises for the Jewish people and there are blessing promises for Ishmael and his descendants. We want to see Ishmael and his descendants blessed. But the covenant has to be through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And all of this stuff with Haman and all of the stuff with Agog was to make God out to be a liar, one who could not keep his covenant promise. Think about it. What happens if Haman had killed all of the Jewish people? Where would Jesus have been born? How could he have been the son of David? How could he have been a descendant of Abraham? But God is faithful to keep his covenant promises. And I say that to you because if God would not keep his covenant promises with the Jewish people, what assurance would we have that he would keep his covenant promises to bring us to everlasting life with Jesus if he were made out to be a liar? But God is true and everybody else is a liar. And God keeps his covenant promises to the Jewish people, but also to us in the church. And so as we go forward, Let's keep in mind the overarching paradigms that we have. We have war against, not flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. We have war against those who say, we don't want peace, no peace. And what do you want us to do? We want you dead. We have war against people who do not want to compromise, who are so chained to the demons of hell that they are going off the cliff into the abyss with them. And our prayers are that chains are broken. Overarching is that understanding. Overarching is the understanding that God is faithful to watch over his word, to perform it in the Jewish people's life and in our life. And if we go out into the world, we can argue about what's going on, but I never um, do. I never argue with people. <laughs> I, I told you I have um, Palestinian um, uh, godchildren, and um, their father is my real good friend, Ramsey, and he, Ramsey is this huge guy. I mean, you don't think of Arabs as big, but Ramsey is big. He's a big guy. And we go out in college campuses, and um, so we, we, we sit up there on the stage, and on this side are the Muslim students, on this side are the Jewish students, on this side are the kind of non-committals, and all around the whole auditorium are police officers. <laughs> it's like, okay. It's kind of like, wow, that's interesting. Um, but we, we do a seminar, and um, the solution for the Middle East, it's the seminar we do, and um, he comes up, and I come up, and we meet in the middle, and he's this big guy, and he gives me a big hugging. Our people kiss you on both cheeks, you know? And we turn and look at the audience, we go, well, that's our seminar, and we sit down. <laughs> uh, what are you talking about? And then we say, look, I can give you my opinion, Ramsey can give you his opinion. I mean, he was from Ramallah, uh, which is in West Bank. Um, but we're only gonna give you God's opinion, because my opinion, everybody has it, yeah. but I'm going to give you what God says as best I can. And that's what I hope to get, have given you tonight, is God's perspective on what's happening in the Middle East. In the context of Daniel, in the context of Esther, in the context of Abraham, Isaac, and Ishmael, in the context of spiritual warfare, that's what's happening today in the Middle East. Amen? Amen. Um, I can take some questions if people want. Yeah. Oh. yeah. 
And bef before I do, um, let's just take a moment to pray that, you know, if, if I said some things crazy or, you know, flippant, you know, God just blow them away. But if I said something that's important to your spirit, that you'd grab hold of it. And I think the most important thing I said, as I'm going through it, is it's our desire, it's God's desire that no one perish, no one perish, but all come to everlasting life in Christ Jesus. So Father, we pray that we would be ambassadors of the Messiah. We would be good representatives of your kingdom. Uh, and we would be able to speak in season and out of season. You would give us opportunities to share your love and love of Jesus with others. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Um, so it looks like we've got some time. We built in. I think we set ourselves apart for some extra time. So Brother Ted has obviously broached the subject of Israel, the church, as you said, just somewhat introductory, further conversation may be, but that conversation may come by way of questions. That would be perfect. <laughs> um, so we want to give you the opportunity, maybe with this extra time that we have, is to uh, take some of what Brother Ted has said outwardly tonight, or things that you might have come with your own questions, not sure where Brother Ted would take this, and now you've heard it and him giving perspective. So are there any of you, I'm really excited to be a runner today, so um, if, if anyone has a question, either what has been said or something that was on your heart in coming tonight that you feel like you still would love a response to tonight uh, with the time that we have remaining, would you like to ask a question? And I will bring the mic to you, and you can, you can do that. Who would want to break the ice? Okay. All right. Terry? Very bold of you, Terry. Now, you know the rule. You're a young at heart. You can't say a word until others can hear you. Right. <laughs> Hold on. I thought it was Sarah. I thought it was Sarah who uh, who laughed, not Abraham. She laughed too. Yep, they both laughed. But I, I showed you in the, in Genesis 17 that Abraham laughed also. Yeah, yeah. Okay. They, they both laughed. But it wasn't at the same. No, they laughed at different times. They, they both were, it just was, it was not fathomable. It, it didn't make sense. It was not possible, right? Not right. possible. Good job, Terry. Yeah. I'm proud of you. So we have the abomination of desolation that it talks about in Daniel. Um, and you're starting, I've been seeing some things about these sacrifice of these red heifers. Do you know any thing towards that or or my understanding is that the sacrifice will happen in the final days and then the, the abomination of desolation will be set up by the, the antichrist will come in what what's your take on that can you speak to that i can speak a little bit to it but i, I don't want to get too deep because it, it's getting into more opinion but i will say that um jesus is the perfect sacrifice you read hebrews 13 and you know that his sacrifice was once and for all. So there's no need to reinstate a sacrificial system. Will it be reinstated? I mean, there are people in Israel now training how to do that. You mentioned the red heifer. They, red heifer is a perfectly red cow, and it's been bred. And so there is a red heifer. Um, the trouble with the whole scenario is that the dome of the mosque sits right where the temple is supposed to be. So how this is all going to play, I do not know. And, um, but I'm interested to see w what is going to happen. Um, I can go either way with whether it's going to happen or not going to happen. What I'm doing is um, praying that the Jewish people will be able to say, um, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord as Jesus returns. Any others? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> good running there. That's right. Yeah, right, I'm ready. Very good. I just wanted to make Pastor Gordon work. <laughs> Seriously, um, with the war going on in Israel right now, um, some say it's safe to go to the Holy Land because it's never attacked, and some say not. Would, would oh, your okay. philosophy I, be? I had that? a good conversation. So if it's probably this is probably not the season to go as a tourist, although you could. Uh, this is if you have a skill 
we were talking about milking cows. I mean, the guys who milk the cows are in the army. Well, the women who milk the cows, they're in the army. The ones who pick the fruit are in the army. I mean, there's practical needs. So this would be a great time to go to Israel as a service. Um, and, and we're actually planning a trip like that with our congregation to be a service because we think that'll be a great witness too. Um, next year, I am praying, next year around this time, to lead a group to Israel back to uh, a more normal tour of where Jesus walked and where he's walking. It's perfectly safe to be there now. It's just going to be a little bit different um, with a war in Gaza and a lot of action up in the north. Um, and then the, you can't even go to the north. I mean, one of the nicest spots in Israel is up by the Galilee. You can't go there because they've evacuated all that land uh, so that um, rockets from Lebanon won't fall on you. So, okay. Yeah. Some others. What's your definition? I heard you mention Gog, about Gog and Mogog. Magog, yeah. What is it or who is it or what? It's, it's, um, ask, 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 ask Pastor Gordon. That's, uh, that's, that, I, I must have slept in seminary during that. But, but I've, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. I mean, it's, it's really true. Um, uh, I um, once... Um, taught a, a, a class in, in a church. We were at a church, and they, had, they said, well, could you teach on the book of Revelation? And I said, well, I don't know anything about the book of Revelation, but okay, I'll teach on the book of Revelation. The place was packed. I mean, there were people. It was like the whole service. And I'm going, why are you here listening to me ramble about something I don't know? It's very exciting, you know, and, um, but I have no no understanding beyond what, what you would have on that. Honestly, I do not. So, Yeah, no, we, uh, we obviously went through, a couple of years back, we went through the book of Revelation here as a church. Uh, we did not get into the details of where Gog and Magog are. I remember, so I'll tell you a little story. I remember when my dad, um, who's a believer when I was a boy, and the, the whole book, The Late Great Planet Earth, right? right. How Lindsay... Um, trying to capture all of the imagery of all of this. I remember sitting at a dining room table with my dad, and he's saying, well, Moscow sits immediately north, right, or directly north, not immediately, that's the wrong way to say it, directly north of Jerusalem. And so there's Gog and Magog, right, because of the description being that of the north. And then you, you mentioned yourself the idea about the, the United Nations and the adversarial picture that we see in the United Nations between many of the other countries, and that of Israel, mm -hmm. and that we that Israel is rather outnumbered in the way that it is being seen. So I remember 40 years ago, right? I remember those conversations with my own dad. 50. 50 years ago, yeah. right, yeah, 1973, I think yeah. is when it was, so 50 now. But I remember those conversations with my dad about, well, that has to be Moscow. And of course, I, I don't think any of us really know for sure if that's exactly where that image will come from or the, the reality of it. Uh, there are some indications, I think we all, like uh, Brother Ted was talking about a little while ago, that you read these things and you're like, wow, it sure seems like something is brewing. It certainly seems that way. Now, what I taught when we went through Revelation together was there have been seasons at every generation of history that think, all the way back to the apostles themselves, that think, uh -huh. well, we must be living in it. And then time passes and God has not acted yet. So... It's hard to say that we will be those that will see it or that it will still be generations beyond our own that will ultimately see it. I would admit it seems as though brewing is happening. Yeah. I don't know if I'm, that's... I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. okay. You. All right, some other questions, some things that you want maybe to bring out with Brother Ted while we've got him here, kind of this experience of a, of a brother Jew. <laughs> I figured you were hanging out over here knowing that he's got to have one at least, you know. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, one of the Messianic ministries I follow is saying that they has had much, a good bit of good news in small pockets of ministry in Israel uh, during the war because of uh, the people, people being more open. Is, has that been what you've uh, heard about as well, read about? So I belong to a covering, my covering organization, my missions covering, is Tikkun Global. Um, and we sent 
back in 30 years ago, the best people that we had to Israel to be, we call them emissaries, you would call them uh, missionaries, but you're not allowed to say missionaries in Israel, so we say emissaries. They are emissaries in land. They've established congregations. They're the people who are doing the day-to-day uh, -day, uh, ministry with the Arabs and the reconciliation ministry that's happening that you, you don't hear about, but it's really happening. Um, and yes, there are more Israelis open uh, to the gospel, um, but I don't think that um, any great numbers have yet come into, maybe in their hearts into relationship with Jesus, but have not yet joined the congregations, and we have a number of congregations in Israel. Um, but when you come with me to Israel next year, um, you can talk with, we're gonna, you know, we go to the congregations, and we'll worship with the people, and you can ask direct, you can see for yourself, um, because the services, these ones we'll go to, they're, they're in Hebrew, but they'll be translated into English, into um, Arahamic, which is the Ethiopian language, into Russian, and into Arabic. So you, you get headphones, and you pick your language, and you can hear it. So all that is going on, uh, but not quite in the numbers that we really expect to see soon, yeah. Well, I, I could ask your thoughts about Hezbollah versus, it seems like Hamas is being disarmed, has been disarmed quite well. I mean, it's been pretty positive in that sense, even, even perhaps uh, spoils, spoils being taken. Uh, but what about Hezbollah? They're behind another country, behind Lebanon. Sure. So, you know, we talked about the prince of Persia, and we said that Persia is Iran. And so Iran and that power and principality of Iran fuels this anti-Jewish, anti-Zionist um, hatred, and um, it also is the power behind Hezbollah. Okay. Any others? Any questions? Did I see a hand? No. Okay, yes, Ms. Deanna. Gordon, thank you for running around, literally, <laughs> literally. Uh, I would like to ask you something that refers to the Jewish people who are living there. I would like to understand how they're taking this, uh, that's going on. And one of the reasons that pricks my mind is because I've been told or read by a good source that there's a higher percentage of billionaires living in Israel than per capita oh. than other nations. And yet on Sunday morning, when we have the TV on getting ready for church, almost between every Christian station you have on, they are asking for money for the Jews who are dying of starvation. Oh, so, um, so you know how I was very upset with um, uh, the church divorcing um, Resurrection Day from Passover? I'm equally upset with that. There's a ministry uh, that you know because you watch the TV uh, that um, wants to allegedly or ostensibly give money to uh, Jewish people, Holocaust survivors, people in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Paul wrote about such a ministry. He said, you go to the ends of the earth to make someone twice the son of hell as you are. They're not preaching the gospel. That's, uh, that's my bottom line. They, that ministry does not preach the gospel. Um, it might do some good, but it doesn't do any good if it, and it actually shields the people from the gospel. But there are ministries in Israel with believers, both Jewish and Gentile, who not only give aid and help out, but also preach the gospel. Um, so those are the ministries I'm choosing to support. Um, just because they have Israel in the name or um, uh, eagles in the name or wings in the name or whatever they have in the name, um, be wise that you want to support a ministry that will preach the gospel because it doesn't do any good for people to be 
physically taken care of and their souls relegated to hell. We want to both physically take care of them and see them come to faith in Jesus. Um, Brother Ted, last time you were with us, you talked about uh, your mom, how yes. we could be praying for your mom. <laughs> Please uh, continue. Uh, when, so I assume she has not come to Jesus not, as Messiah? No, she's uh, going to be 101. Wow. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> and, and she has all her faculties, and she's mm. going to be with us. It's really nice. She'll be with us uh, this year, very soon, two weeks, and then she'll stay through Passover. Wow. So she'll get to experience the Passover like we did. So she's going to hear the gospel. Mm. So we pray that her heart be open. And when you share things like this, so if you were, to, I, I, I don't imagine you would do it in the same context of sort of speaking in a lecture style of, the, of all of the verses, but how do those come out in conversation with your mother as you talk about that spirit of sort of, and, and watching God maintain relation with his people all throughout. She's obviously, she would, I, I, well, I don't know, obviously, would she see herself under those covenants of connection from the Old Testament for, for us, the Hebrew scriptures, would she see herself under that, and how then does it, where does it stop short in her heart that Jesus has made himself known? Yeah, so uh, thank you so much, yeah. and thank church for those who want to pray Two prayers. One is selfish. Please pray for me and my sisters because we're trying to take care of my mom who's 101 and we're, uh, you know, we all have different opinions about how that should be. But the most important one is, as Pastor Gordon said, about her spirit. And so when we do Passover, and I, I mentioned, and we did a Passover where um, you sit around a table and it's not a lecture at all. And, and the kids get to talk and the, the um, Juice gets spilled, and there's crumbs, and there's a lot going on. But the story of Passover is told, and, when, and I, the good news is I'm the oldest now. I'm in charge. I mean, I'm the oldest. So I get to lead it the way I want to, and I bring in, at the right points, uh, those kind of understanding. Um, but you have to have ears to hear. And so if you pray for my mom, pray for ears to hear. Her spirit would be open that she wouldn't, um, Jewish people tend to um, just say, but I'm Jewish, that doesn't apply to me. And I'm going, no, it applies to you more because Jesus is Jewish and the, and the disciples are Jewish and the Passover points to Jesus. Um, so we, we need a, a spiritual awakening, just like any other person needs and a spiritual awakening. how long awakening. have you been a believer again? I've been a believer now since 1976. My email address is redeemed76. So uh, just uh, 1976, which now seems like before a lot of you all were born. Um, but, uh, right? But, yeah. All right. Uh, any others? Okay. Ms. Paula? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, when this all started, I think everyone's heart was with the Israelis. And now it seems like there are so many people that are saying, that the Israelis are hurting the Palestinians, and uh, how do we handle that? I mean, we, yeah. we still believe that it started with the attack on the Israelis, and yet that has been lost almost. Yeah, and there's still hostages. Yeah, you have 100 Wait, hostages. Why? Where are they? Have, why so, don't they trade them? So um, I, I mentioned Daniel prayed Against, and the angel Michael came against the spirit of Persia, and then he said, I'm going back to fight Persia, and the spirit of Grisha is coming. The spirit of Grisha is the spirit of the media, secular humanism, fairness, and that's what we're up against now. So it's a matter of prayer. Um, it, for those of you who are spiritual, you understand it doesn't make any sense at all. Um, I, you know, I've been thinking about the United States in World War II, how much, um, and maybe this is a horrible thing to say, but we didn't give uh, the people of Dresden much notice. Uh, and when we had to take out Dresden, uh, we did send leaflets over Hiroshima, but, you know, nobody believed it. Um, but war is a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing. And, and people who are chained to, to darkness and... You know, if you're on a plane and the pilot is suicidal, it, that's nothing to do with you. 
So there's horrible things that happen. There really are horrible things that happen. And we pray for that to end. And we pray that as a result of people seeing Israel's victory, many people come to faith in Jesus. That's our prayer. Um, but my, our hearts are broken. You know, it's, it's, it's a horrible situation all around. Um, but you know, Hamas is using the hospitals, using the civilians, because they care more for their ideology than they do for the people. It's, it's horrible, and uh, it's heartbreaking. It's dastardly. Um, but it's a spiritual battle. It's a spiritual battle. Please continue to pray with understanding. Yeah. Well, there are a few more. Any other questions? Yeah, Dave. This is more of a comment than a question. Um, in reading Daniel, when it comes to the part where he says, where the angel comes and says, I would have come sooner, but I was doing battle. To me, that says so much that one of the one of the archangels is fighting a battle and it's taken that long. And sometimes we think in terms of God just speaks it and it happens, but there's a spiritual battle constantly going on. And I think our, like you said, our prayer is more of a spiritual nature for the people of the Middle East right now on all sides because they're, the demonic forces don't care about the people. And they are there, if anything else, to destroy the people. And that's part of the, the problem with war is those demonic forces don't care about the people. That's a really good point because people are then, who are destroyed, um, haven't been given the opportunity to know who Jesus is. Uh, and maybe the opportunity is just about to happen. And so the demons are, why do the nations rage against God and his anointed? Oh, so that's a very good insight, yeah. Okay, a couple more minutes. We'll begin to wrap up here, but if there are any questions you want to... Uh... So I, I think what Miss Paula is also kind of saying, or what I'm kind of feeling, is that w none of us trust our media network here in the United States at all. And I don't care if it's Fox or if it's the other group. There's always, a, there's always a, an agenda. How can we get good news coming close or coming out of Israel? It seems like the BBC knows more about American politics than what our own people are reporting. You know, is there, is BBC there any is, is not, not my cup of tea is there any either. But uh, yes. Where? So let, we were. Just, I just mentioned we were in Williamsburg, Virginia, and have you ever been to Williamsburg? It's very cool. And the coolest thing in Williamsburg is they have people come up on the stage and uh, talk. And we, we were there with Fortune, and George Washington came up, and he was talking as if he was just about to end his eight years of presidency. And the last time we were there, we, my wife and I heard um, Martha Washington. And Martha Washington, the thing that struck us was she said, um, the newspaper wrote absolute lies about me. They said I didn't support my husband, George, and I had to actually leave Virginia and go up to New England to be with George to show people that I supported him. So I, 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 they give you questions and answers at the end of their presentation. I said, uh, you know, uh, General Washington, President Washington, um, how did you deal with the media? You know, <laughs> And, and, you know, they're savvy. They, they know what you're really asking. And he said, well, here's two things. One is there were a couple papers just established, in the newspapers, established just to write bad things about me and my administration. So there were papers that that was how they came into being, and that's what they did. And then he said, uh, what I do is I subscribe to them. So he would read what they were saying. Um, how do you get... All that to say, there is some news from Israel, but the news I would direct you to is more in the spiritual realm. Yeah, because I, I, um, we're subject to the same, you know, if the Israeli government's talking, if the Hamas people are talking, whoever's talking, you're going to get their slice. New York Times is talking, they have a slant. In every, so I read, I read everything. My wife drives my wife crazy. She doesn't like these magazines coming into the house. Or these, but I read them. And, um, but spiritually, I can give you a website that you can get spiritually what's happening, which 
to me is the most important because that we can we can when we pray we can really bend things in the spirit our prayers are mighty for right so um you can have some spiritual understanding but you, you, yeah. Um, so it's Tikkun Global, T I K K U N G L O B A L, Tikkun Global, and um, you can get some some good spiritual insight there. Yeah. Uh, we've got just a couple minutes. Uh, Ted, do you want to give? You had provided some information that makes me think, as you were talking about this website. Also, just your, your pamphlet that was out here. Would you like to say just a word about? I have cards out there. I just got a website. Um, and, <laughs> you know, I, you know I'm, I'm from old school. You know, hey, t talk to me. That's but great. some people have convinced me to get a website. So I got a website. <laughs> has a couple things on it. Um, I asked Tony if, he, if we can do a video or we can get some pictures on it so I can populate it with more things. But I have a card out there, and it's perforated. If you fill out your name and address, you will get two things. You will get one thing. You will get, well, you get two things. You'll get my newsletter. And I actually do a physical newsletter unless you tell me you'd rather get it by email. And I can send it to you by email. But you'll get a physical newsletter, and you'll get any updates uh, that I have. Um, you won't get asked for money. You'll just get updates. So if you take the time to fill out the cards, that would be super, and I'd appreciate it and a way to stay in touch. Yeah. Uh, for our church, you guys know that we have been, Lynn today uh, spoke out of the book of Romans. We, did a, we started a series a few weeks ago to add on out of the book of Romans. And one of the things I mentioned to you is, uh, it is, it is, I think the, I've mentioned this, that in the New Testament, there's not a New Testament book that refers to Old Testament story, narrative, as the book of Romans, that God is connecting uh, the gospel that we understand from the New Testament, the story of Jesus, he's connecting it to a story of continuity from the very beginning, uh, which I, I love this idea of when we speak of Israel and the church and, and the last days, that, uh, that a book like Romans, which, which Gentile Christians and maybe Jewish Christians alike love. Uh, we're, it's funny you say that because... Um I am not a pastor. I am uh, an elder in a congregation. So we have a head rabbi, and I'm just an elder. But he's assigned us now to preach from the Book of Romans. Oh wow! So I'm going to tune into your website, <laughs> and I'm going to—I'm really going to do some good. Yeah. Well, that's—we uh, have not yet. So Romans five was today. Lynn did a wonderful job. Um, we will get to Romans, obviously nine, ten, and eleven. Right which are very consequential chapters. I'm good on 9, 10, and 11. Uh, <laughs> but it's the, it's the first part that I'm... Right. Yeah. No, that's very good. Well, I, I can't wait to get to 9, 10, and 11 because of the connection that yeah. it is between the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers yeah. and Paul saying, I'm evidence of a remnant yeah. that is coming. It's so exciting. When you get to there... It's, it, you're going to pray for Jewish people to be saved because Jewish people, what will their salvation be but life from the dead? It's mm -hmm. going to be so exciting as more and more Jewish people get saved. So that's great that you're reading Romans. That's, and and I'm really going to eavesdrop when I can. No, that, that'll be <laughs> Thank great. You. I just want to close maybe as we wrap up this time. I'm sure you would welcome any, if someone sure. could come up and I'm, speak to you yeah. privately or just want to ask a, a couple more questions. We want to respect our 8 o'clock time frame that we said from the start and give you all the chance to go on home if you would like to grab maybe a, a to-go bag i don't know yeah, maybe Aaron, you can talk to Aaron about Aaron that and Sam uh, a great job. <laughs> she'll fix it for you yeah. no i'm just kidding um uh no that you can you can obviously head out here in just a few minutes we'll we'll wrap up our official time but if maybe you have some questions I want to take the liberty because holding the mic like I am, um, I've shared this with our congregation as well. So one thing is Romans. We're going through Romans very, very systematically trying to understand God's story as he tells it there. There's also the passage I've used before with our congregation out of Isaiah. And if you need to correct anything that I would say about it, I'm really going to try and say very little about it and just get your thoughts, uh, Ted. In uh, Isaiah 19, verses 23 through 25, on that day, there will be a road from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians will come in, come into Egypt, and the Egyptians into Assyria, and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. 
On that day, Israel will be the third party to Egypt, and Assyria a blessing in the midst of the earth, mm -hmm. whom the Lord of the armies has blessed, saying, Blessed is Egypt my people, and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. Hallelujah. I yes. Just from your perspective, what even with what you shared tonight well, and all of what sure. that means, kind of. Well, I mentioned that we are doing reconciliation in the Middle East. And when we, co when we go to Israel, we'll actually sit in on some of those reconciliation meetings, um, take communion with Arab believers from Syria, from Jordan, uh, from Egypt. And um, you, you'll see it. It's, it's going to happen. And um, we're, we're seeing the beginning of it. You know, it's the like kingdom of God is breaking through. It's not yet fully manifest, but it is breaking through. And we're living in the generation that the prophets long to see. Yeah, that's exciting. Okay. All right. Well, let's go ahead and... Can you get that website one more time? Sure. Can you do that for uh, us, Ted? Tikkun Global. T-I-K-K-U-N-G-L-O-B-A-L. Tikkun Global. T-I-K-K-U-N. Tikkun is a Hebrew word. It means restoration, restoration of all things. So Tikkun Global. Dot com. Uh, um, I think it's dot org, but I'm org. not. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, okay, I'm, dot org. I, I'm not sure. Is it We're dot going org? with org? Let's okay. say org. Well, you'll find it. Try one of the endings. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, good. Well, let me, uh, if it'd be all right, is just to pray oh, over please, yeah. uh, Brother Ted, and uh, thanks to Aaron yes. very much. Uh, huge effort that Aaron put into this, and she always gets help. She's never alone, but always has that of her right hand. Nicely done. Yeah. Sam. Nicely done. Yeah. And, and never also, alone. Also to Tony. And to Tony, uh, yes. for sure. I, and now Kara. That's Kara back there. She's really good on the slides. Okay, she she good. really helped. Yeah. <laughs> Look at Tony. Good. <laughs> Let's give her a big round. Um, no, it is always, this. so this is my third occasion with uh, Ted. A few of you have had extras because he'd been here maybe before yeah. my arrival. Uh, and always is a delight, whether it is our Seder or last time it was the Feast of Trumpets, yeah, and yeah. that was really a lot of fun. And then, of course, this one as well. And, and just the, the very high-level interest that we have in these very issues that are coming down. And I love how Ted introduced it, maybe has more to, to delve into in future occasions, but just really setting the right course. I, I love it from a believer who desires, just like Ted does, to see all men come to know Jesus. Okay. And that's you can just hear that coming from him as a Jewish man, but seeing others and having those godchildren from other, yeah. uh, from Arab descent, and obviously us as, as uh, Gentiles, that he loves spending time with us. That's very meaningful, and, and so we really have a great friend in Ted. So thanks for coming back. In my heart. Thank Absolutely. You. Let's pray for him. Father God, I thank you so much that I, along with a number of our church family members, have had the privilege of getting to know Ted over the years to come to various events that he has been a part of. He speaks so warmly of us and of, of what we are doing here. And Lord, we feel oftentimes, I know I do, very humbled mm. by what he is accomplishing among uh, your, your chosen people, those that you had chose from, from generations so far back, even in our biblical story as we read them, that we have a real live Jewish lover of Jesus. And that is a delight to our hearts. Lord, it is a delight to us. We, we are those who are privileged to call Jesus our Savior. He and all of us together, the Messiah, the one that was promised from long ago. And so, Lord, we thank you that as he comes and shares that vision of a, of a man of the covenants who has come to know Jesus as his own Savior, the Messiah that was promised, Lord, that you would give him favor among his family you would give him favor among Jewish friends who have yet to, to embrace Jesus as Messiah. And Lord, we thank you that our friendship includes things of prayer, the things that speak his name before you, asking for favor in those areas, and even ones that I haven't mentioned, but just in any area that his hands touch, in his heart, and his mind, and eyes, and ears. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for a, a place like this that welcomes one another in the name of Christ, in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, and our brotherhood and sisterhood extends um, beyond all these barriers. We, we think of Paul's counsel to the Galatians, Lord, that there is no longer Jew or Greek, but all are 
standing before Jesus in his grace. Thank you. And we thank you for it. Bless him as he heads home, his safe travel, and just that there will be other occasions where we can spend time with him again. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Pastor. You bet. So good, Ted. And uh, if you do have just personal conversations, feel free. I'm sure he'll visit for a few moments. Um, otherwise, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful evening. Thanks for coming.